anything else, but everybody has a say. It's democratically organized. So instead of just taking line order items from the boss, you have a say over everything uh, with your coworkers. Um, let's see. Um, I, I actually want to want to cover this stuff. If you want to jump in on the Yeah. Okay. So we're running a bit over time. Uh, so I'm quickly gonna. So for those of you who just came in, this is introduction to anarchism, libertarian socialism, and uh, Patrick has been giving some examples of anarchism. Uh, in acting its values through how it organizes. And now I'm going to talk a bit about occupation, so essentially giving some background to the occupation we have here in Boston uh, with a bit of an anarchist perspective. All right, so um, anarchists are very excited about the occupation movement across America right now, and there are a lot of trends that we're seeing happening again that have happened before. So. Uh, Seattle, 1999, the protests that shut down the, the w, WTO meetings. Um, that was a great example of both democracy and action because of how it was organized democratically, inclusively, uh, in a horizontal manner, uh, and also because of its emphasis on direct action. Rather than petitioning these, uh, leader, these leaders of the WTO to not make this horrible decision, uh, the protesters had to take the direct route just say, well, rather than let you meet and make this horrible decision, we're just going to not let you meet. We're going to block you out of your buildings. Um, so that required, like the Occupy Boston, uh, uh, massive numbers of protesters to come in and reclaim this uh, piece of land from the state and say, no, this is, this is now uh, a space that is going to be run along democratic lines. So that was 1999. Uh, again, in the U.S., there were uh, in 2008. There was uh, for a short period of time. There was something called the Occupy uh, Everything movement. It was primarily on the West Coast. It was primarily targeted at universities. But again, we saw this emphasis on retaking uh, space. In this case, space from the state university systems by putting a lot of people in there, and then have it, once those people are in there. Uh, making decisions in a democratic manner. So again, we see the same practice of uh, direct action by going uh, going into a space and take, uh, taking it away from either the state or school or business and then uh, enacting out the democratic processes that you want to see reflected in the rest of society. Um, the Occupy, move, uh, Occupy Everything movement in the U.S. Uh, dovetailed uh, at the same time as that's this massive uprising in Greece in uh, December of 2008, uh, winter, early winter of 2009, uh, in, uh, where there was just there was just massive unrest in response to a single uh, murder by police. I mean, if you just think of how many people the police kill in the U.S. per year, it's amazing that people essentially shut down Greece for a good three to six weeks, depending on where you were, in response to this one murder. Uh, of an of an anarchist youth uh, in a in a neighborhood in Athens that is very much associated with the anarchist movement, um, and again we see a similar type of pattern uh, occupation of public spaces of uh, businesses. Uh, in one case, they uh, took over a TV station and hijacked the broadcast essentially, uh, and then also in Greece uh, since it's very much a tourist industry there. They took over the Parthenon, hung up their own banners and things like that. And uh, there, these were a combination of both general assemblies, so people, uh, same structure here where it's just sort of anybody can come in. But then there was also this very strong presence in Greece of neighborhood assemblies. So people who knew their neighbors really well had done actions and political de deliberations with their neighbors. Uh, so there's very much this uh, place-based assemblies that people could go uh, and decide how they want to, how they want their neighborhood to look. Uh, there's this great story uh, again about the neighborhood Exarchia, in which they, uh, which the city said, "Well, we're going to build a subway station here," and the neighborhood association said, "Hell, you are!" and uh, tipped over the uh, the forklift and re and essentially remade the park that they, the city had been threatening to uh, to turn into a subway station. Um, so. Again, the movement in Greece very much uh, anarchist inspired there directly. And then uh, at the same time as all this is happening here in the US, there's uh, the, the movement in Madrid uh, where 
unlike the U.S. where it's popping up all around the country, in Spain people are essentially just descending on this one plaza in the capital of Madrid and taking it back. And uh, yeah, it's the same. It's the same tactics and strategies that we're seeing across here in the U.S. People coming into a public space, uh, saying that we're going to make decisions democratically and we're not leaving. Um, and then there's the similar question of, well, what do you like? Uh, of demands. Um, obviously, the anarchists um, don't see a whole lot of value in the demands because they tend both to fracture us and also, um, um, while it may placate some people in the mainstream media, because as I'm sure you've heard, uh, mainstream media is very much focused on how we don't have any demands and how we should have demands. But I mean, if you go back to uh, Seattle 1999, like I was saying, there, there was a very concrete demand, shut down the WTO, stop these free trade, free trade agreements. Well, the media got that message, and instead of saying, oh, great, you have a demand, uh, we know exactly what we want to say, they said, no, 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 that's not enough. You need to know exactly what you're going to do to, uh, in, uh, to replace the system. You can't just say no to the free trade agreements. You just can't say no to the WTO. You have to give us a detailed plan of what you're going to enact in its place. So it's really, you can't, you can't satisfy them. So it's, it's uh, you don't, yeah, you don't really want to go down that road if you don't have to. Okay, so I've been talking a bit about the anarchist, uh, these anarchist values within these occupation movements uh, the past decade or so. And now I just want to zoom out for another angle on the big picture. Uh, so we've been talking a lot about uh, anarchists and anarchism within a very uh, American or European uh, frame of mind, but it's important to recognize that these values that we've been talking about, uh, we can also see them in indigenous societies around the world in a variety of different time periods. Uh, and I'm not... Um, so... And they're definitely not going to look like anarchists in the U.S. or in England or uh, in Scandinavia or something like that. They're going to have very different ways of going about, uh, about these. Uh, but at the same time, we can see them uh, acting in a way to encourage genuine freedom, to encourage egalitarianism uh, that practices direct action uh, and things like that in Madagascar, where uh, thanks to the French uh, under colonial rule, they propped up this... Um, this uh, monarchy that was in Madagascar, but uh, there's uh, there was a turning away from the monarchy, and, and, and a lot of the, this entailed was a revival of uh, certain religious practices in Madagascar that essentially said, "Well, this is more important than what's going on in the centri- uh, in the kingdom of the, uh, under the king." So you should value these uh, local group, uh, these local practices, and what you're doing with your family and your clan so of what's going on in the kingdom. Um, and you could do a similar analysis of what's uh, the history of Southeast Asia all the way back to the, uh, the imperial rule of the, Chi- of, of the Chinese in the first millennium, um, so from zero, uh, zero to a thousand uh, common era. You can see these people like being forced into under uh, forced into life under imperial Chinese rule, but at the same time, uh, very often, very uh, a lot of the time, looking to escape that, go up to these hills where it was very hard for people on horseback to go around and gather taxes, um, and they could, uh, by sort of hiding themselves from these imperial rulers, they could uh, they could live out life in a much more egalitarian fashion. Oftentimes, they are forced to uh, have a much lower standard of living than when they could be down south and raise rice, but at the same time it gave them more freedom. And now a contemporary example of uh, indigenous ideas mixing with anarchism and also Marxism to a certain extent are the Zapatistas in Mexico uh, in uh, 1994 when they uh, uh, seceded from the Mexican government and set aside the, their own area for their own autonomous uh, rule uh, by what they call the good government, uh, which uh, has a very complex uh, practice to ensure that it is inclusive, that they hear uh, all the voices in their community and um, essentially makes decisions very slowly. <laughs> and basically, um, when, when they, but they aren't just. Uh, seceding and doing their own thing. They're still very much talking to people in Mexico, to people in North America, um, 
I'm from New York, and I know that uh, there's a group uh, in East Harlem called Movement for Justice in El Barrio, and they're very much in dialogue with the Zapatistas and uh, what it means for them to be struggling against capitalism in uh, Manhattan, as well as in uh, the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. All right, um, so that's our discussion, uh, so that's our lecture. And now we're going to move into the discussion section. Do people want to stay here, or do we want to move somewhere else so it's easier for people to sit down and talk to each other? Let's okay. Show of hands. Draw poll. Who wants to stay here? All right. Who wants to move? Who will we lose? Who will we lose if we move? Everyone on energy. All right. Well, yeah. Let's. My sense is that we should have a system where there is some combination of libertarianism and socialism that libertarian in and of itself is seen as a person that I kind of think libertarian socialism is kind of anti-feminist. You, you, you think, it, yeah, I think that there's an interesting etymological you know, history of that word. Um, it was only until, yeah, if, if you look before the 1970s or so, um, the word libertarian is generally synonymous with anarchism. The idea that, um, yeah, that liberty was about liberty of the individual. I think the modern capital L libertarian movement could probably be best, better described as the propertarian movement because it exalts the private property, that right, above all else. If I'm starving, I can't have an apple off your orchard unless you say so, even if it means I suck. It's, it's that kind of amoral, I've heard, it's a very different sense of what. Uh, you were talking about cooperative um, uh, workplaces, and you were talking about uh, creating institutions from the bottom up. Oh. Are there any examples of that actually having been done with healthcare to provide, you know, kind of medical services that people need? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, not on the level of food up bombs, which is a very low level, but a place with you could actually get the technologies and the expertise. Who creates all of that stuff? Is it the people or is it, you know, this right. government or money? Um, yeah, well, the, I mean, I have no argument with you. I'm asking, is, are there yeah. examples of that actually having been done? And how do we go about doing uh, okay. that? Yeah, absolutely. So, for example, um, my good friend Jasper does uh, grassroots organizing in Appalachia, uh, in Southwest Virginia. And one of the things he was talking about, there's a history of, you know, basically, you know, the rural poor are just absolutely not served by the healthcare system as it is right now. Um, what uh, communities would do is band together their resources to actually hire local, like, a doctor to come from the city or from elsewhere. And set up like a roaming clinic. So that's, I mean, that's just on a, a tiny little level. But um, in, uh, for example, in Spain in the 1930s, right on the cusp of uh, the Spanish Civil War and Revolution, um, huge swaths of Spain are, me, were democratized. Um, everything from the barber shops were run as co-ops to the hospitals. So instead of, uh, you know, question of how much money you have when you enter the door, it was simply a matter of triage. It was a matter of using the resources. Um, not only were teachers, but also doctors sent out to the countryside where they were needed most. I think, in terms of any any other kind of industry, the, the priority should be on you know how do you best serve people, especially the ones who are serving. So I think there, there's certainly lots of examples. Anyone? Uh, I was just going to offer to take stack because uh, there's been a lot of hands up here. That's why I figured it out. Does anyone know the name of that thing that happened? In, uh, during Hurricane Katrina, it was like, you know, like anarchists set up like collective. clinics and all that. Yeah, Common Ground Collective. I think that's an example of that if you want to check it out. They have a book about it and uh, they have like a trailer of it that you can see on a video down yeah. And uh, to respond to you, uh, organizational models that are similar to that are the remote access medical. Uh, it's in both the rural U.S. and then around the world. Again, it's about, uh, similar to what Patrick was talking about, bringing uh, medical access outside of the cities because that's where so much of the medical technology and uh, knowledge is. But not everybody lives in the city. Uh, but then within cities, uh, in New York, there's something called the Rock Dove Collective, uh, where it's people trying to uh, share uh, their medical uh, 
uh, medical labor, in a sense, uh, through non-monetary means. I don't know too much about it myself, but uh, if you want to look more into that, I'd definitely check out the box of those. Then we were sunglasses and hats. Sorry. Uh, I do uh, so we're talking, you're talking sort of at the end about like a wider definition of anarchism. I think that's super important because the biggest argument that we've run into a lot of times will be like, well, it's just human nature. Human nature needs people in charge. Human nature needs people to say things. So the best argument I, for me against that is like in all the history of humanity, and like if you study anthropology or look at it at all, you know, we've only had governments since Justinian, like was that 8,000 BC, something like that, which is a tiny like, dot in human history. And only a little bit of the total human population was under government. Exactly. So it's like over 80, 90 percent of human history we've had non-government organizations. So the idea that we can't survive without governments is the silliest idea. It's like, oh, it's just counter human nature. But beyond, like we're talking about political, and which is obviously super important, I totally agree with everything. But um, beyond just the political idea of anarchism, you know, even in the last 200 years, you have people like, you know, uh, before... Time, they were basically talking about this. And so it's like. It's, indigenous cultures are important as well because that shows that it, that it is possible. Yeah. So it's more like the existential issue of I'm born here. How come all these people are in charge? So, like, I was born in this place and then there are all these rules against me for no reason at all. So I just think that as far as anarchism is a really important issue. The human nature is absolutely something that, that has to be confronted head on. And the interesting thing is that it works both ways. Um, <laughs> For people ha who have generally a positive view of human nature, anarchism is, is a very logical choice. But for people with a very cynical view of human nature, that humans will, you know, they will seize power and they will abuse power whenever they get the chance. They'll always work in their own interest and not in anybody else's. Um, then the only rational system would be anarchism, because the only way to keep people from abusing power would be to eliminate those conditions of power. Um, I was wondering what quality, what qualities and traits do you work on as an individual to develop a state of anarchism in yourself so you don't allow people to get over on you all the time and then eat your lunch most of the time. And how do you, what, what, quality, what qualities and traits do you uh, cultivate and develop in your own time so you can, you know, not just leave the group, you can do it in your own time. I think for me, the uh, quality, I, I, I connect most with that, uh, with anarchism is just the, uh, uh, the challenge to authority, which for me usually means daring to ask questions, daring to, daring to propose alternatives, uh, whether it's like alternative social experiments like this or just uh, different interpretations of knowledge in general. But it's, um, I think that's a great question to bring back to the personal. Um, so I think uh, inquiry for me is very important, but also being able to listen deeply to what other people are saying. Uh, because if you can't listen to what other people are saying, then it's 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 very easy to fall back onto these hierarchical positions where if you're above somebody, you don't need to listen to what they're saying because you can just tell them what you want them to do. And if you're below somebody, like, uh, you don't need to have a very nuanced understanding about what they want you to do because you can just keep on doing it wrong and then eventually they'll kick you or shoot you until you think you do it right. So I think uh, being able to listen very clearly is for me a, uh, a treat that I really value. So we got a whole bunch of hands. One, uh, uh, this is not even relevant to this, but are any of you guys hungry? Because I'm going to go grab food and offer something back if you guys are hungry. Yes, You guys want water or something? Yeah. Thank you. We have you and then correct response. <laughs> Real quick. Um, something I would recommend is to, because I think the first thing is to see how these things are entrenched in our society and make us think all these things is human nature, think this capitalism is the only way thing, it's discourse theory and social construction theory. So to realize that the idea of Not in the anarchy sense, but in the sense of you know, my way or the highway. The idea of markets as hegemony and the only truth. To realize that these things are ideas, and that's all they are, and they're pushed through our minds in, in school, 
in TV, in media, in everything that we see around us and everything we do, to realize that first and start seeing the world and these social constructions, these things start moving. And, and, it's, and, and on the, the level that's just a slightly bit more social than the individual, it's you know the personal relationships we have with our friends, with people and you know who are, live in our building, if we're in an apartment, or live in our neighborhood. Um, there are ways you know we can we can uh, you know freely uh, interact with others. My mom, who's like totally apolitical, you know, she uh, she sort of like pats me on the head when I start talking politics. And, uh, but, I mean, if you look at actually what she does, she's she's doing more anarchism than I am. So she's a yoga teacher. She is teaching yoga free to people in low-income communities. She's, you know, and this is just the thing that makes me feel good. She set up a program where um, the whole neighborhood went in on uh, one snowblower. And then we, like, would, would like, you know, because winters in Pennsylvania can get really bad, you know, then... All, they, all you do is you just take turns and like everybody makes sure everybody's, you know, has um, sidewalks or snowball. Like there are just these little things that you can do in everyday life that prefigure the future we want, but also make shit that we live in. Okay, who's next? Um, I just had something to add, I guess, that kind of like relates to this and then also back to the um, uh, aspect of uh, human nature, because um, I think something that can be important to do. Uh, Thank you very much, sir. Uh, just a good exercise, kind of like questioning uh, assumptions, because I think there's a lot of assumptions uh, behind these ideas of, of what is what is human nature, what do humans need in order to be, you know, productive or cooperative or or so forth, um, and because uh, it's not necessarily, you know, um, you had mentioned having like kind of a cynical versus an optimistic view of people, because it's not it's not necessarily being cynical so much as it's really uh, um, uh, idea that's been put forth by the culture that humans are this way. It's not like we're we're saying like oh it's it's um, yeah it's not a, a cynicism. It's just like well this is how it is. Like nature is presented in a certain way, and that. Uh, concept allows us to rationalize a lot of behaviors, um, such as controlling people. If we're, you know, if we're chaotic, then we need to be controlled. And along the same lines as um, as, as the Earth being here for us to dominate and use resources, um, etc. So. The question about sort of the personal side of this, I think, is. is important for a lot of these reasons, and I think, I think that a lot of anarchists and a lot of other people sort of have an image of how, how we would all be if the world was different, and we try to, we try to be that way, but we, didn't, we never really learned how to be that way, and, and so we run into problems because it turns out maybe we're more competitive than we really think we should be, we get more jealous, we get more possessive. Shop, out of shopping is, is good for us. And, and so I think it can be discouraging if we try to do that on our own. And, and I think anarchists have yeah, so generally not been individualists. They generally try to work with others. You know, it's not just do your own thing, but it's do your own thing with a group of people that you have something in common with and have mutual connections with and mutual connections. So, so I think that's, I think that's a, a difficult thing. I think, I think there's sort of a whole other world of people trying to work on things like like these particular issues that's not really a political world but has teaches skills that would be useful for people who are anarchists and other radicals to learn. You know, things like nonviolent communication, things like you know, these different sort of things that a lot of a lot of political people sort of dismiss as too new age or too individualistic are actually teaching skills, a lot of which would be really useful here in running general assembly and, 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 and doing a lot of so I think sort of bridging those two worlds is an interesting kind of project. Yeah, I think that something that we should be wary of here, like as anarchists, is like what I see is a lot of signs of people demanding things from the government. Like we want the taxes to be more for wealthy people. And that's all fine and good. I mean, I don't think I agree with that. Taxes should be more for wealthy people. Right. But when you start demanding that the government do things, that puts you, that disempowers you. 
from an anarchist perspective, that disempowers you because right. you're asking for something, and you are basically what you're doing is you're 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 uh, you're throwing in the cards and you're saying, okay, you have power, over me. and that's not what the anarchist uh, that's not what anarchists believe. I think that anarchism is about it's about rights and responsibilities. And you can't have one without the other. So I'm sorry, that last it's about both rights and responsibilities. And I don't think you can have one without the other. I think that we live in a system where we have to fight for our rights, but we're also put in a position where we do not have to take responsibility. Because, you know, the government provides all this stuff for us, and, you know, yeah. we don't take responsibility for the next person that's um, the job of the police, you know, or whoever, right. the government. Um, so, one thing I'd like to see here, just in line with what you're saying, is an emphasis on creating collective businesses. Okay, so, instead of a corporation whose sole motivation is profit, who's owned by stockholders, not owners, if we take action and whatever the government, this is beyond the government, this is just us as people, and we set up collectives that exist in a free market, but the goal of the collective is not profit for somebody else, it is to, number one, make sure that the community serves the community. So we're we're have People have their jobs. Yeah, I mean, it could be, it's just, it's, well, it, people have their jobs. If you break even, that's fine. It's not to make a profit. If you make some profit, it goes back to the workers who put the labor in. And, and I think if you do that enough, you set up enough of these, who's going to want to work for some corporation that's owned by stockholders and they're just going to be in this hierarchical system? Nobody's going to want to. Everybody's going to want to work for a collective where know you're taken care of and you're a part owner. So that's what I think we have to create. We don't have to just, the more we just ask for the government, the more, for things from the government, the more disempowered we are. I, I, so we have yeah. power. So yeah, two things. I, I think, first off, in terms of demands, I think that's that's an incredibly smart way to think of it. Um, the only demands that I've ever seen um, that are useful are ones that are really not so much aimed at the powers that be, but are aimed at people like us. To either get us involved in the movement, to bring us in so we can all learn a bit more about what this is, to experiment um, with new ways of doing things. Um, uh, Trotsky, who I usually discount, actually has a really cool idea um, called the transitional demand. And the traditional de transitional demand is a demand that seems very reasonable on its face, to any you know just reasonable person, but it's something that you know the government and the economy cannot do unless we're essentially to get rid of capitalism. So, like for example, you know, uh, you know, free housing for all. Like that sounds reasonable. You know, we all need to have housing to live. That's you know, that's what we can get on board with. That's not something that we can seriously like you know put in legislation and pass. It's not something that really fits with having elites do things for us. It's a way of organizing. It's a way of showing people what our priorities. are. So I think, yeah, as long as we don't have demands that are specifically like HR 121, just don't think it. Um, <laughs> I, I think we'll, we'll be better off. And I think absolutely co-ops are important, um, especially co-ops that are connected to each other, that, you know, there are, there are networks of co-ops that sort of give discounts to other co-ops, that'll operate at a loss when dealing with other co-ops. Um, the, the trick is, I mean, oftentimes, uh, if it's not regulations that kill co-ops, it's... Um, it's, it's the gold of capital. So a lot of, I mean, almost all co-ops, once they get past the six month mark, are usually very successful, very profitable, and you know, just like paragons of efficiency and, uh, and productivity. However, because they succeed at all these capitalist values, they're at a very high premium. Oftentimes, um, co-ops will simply get bought out. You know, so co-op members will have, all right, do I, do I stay, at, you know, a co-worker, you know, co-owner at a co-op, or do I not have to work ever again as long as I live? I mean, <laughs> so there, there's that almost quasi-Faustian bargain. So I think showing people and keeping people in a movement 
not simply just a workplace. I think. I'm sorry, we have a lot of people on. Yeah. Uh, so it's almost five o'clock. We have three more questions. We're gonna field those three questions, and then uh, we're happy to talk to people uh, after that. But I think we're gonna close out. Uh, so it's almost five o'clock. Human beings, from the, human beings from their onset were anarchistic beings. They were not organized into collectives. If you look at the Native Americans, you look at African societies, the tribal culture, they were organized into anarchistic societies. And when government started, government by its nature is oppressive. You just look at the feudal governments, you look at the oppressive governments that took over and eradicated that anarchistic culture from them. They started out as oppressive societies. And as they progressed, it became slightly less oppressive, but still, at their core being, they are still oppressive, oppressive entities. Uh, I just kind of wanted to respond to the idea that we shouldn't ask for, like, it's, as an anarchist, asking for any kind of legislation is kind of a concession. Like, I sort of agree with that. Like, I'm very silly to get you, like, I hate the government, but I want the government to do something. But, like, um, there's two things we have to recognize, I guess, that like we're working with all these other people. So isn't there this kind of has to be kind of like the lowest common denominator of what everyone can agree on? And there is definitely legislation that helps everyone. You know, like when we get something like 40 hour work week or like children can't work or something, like there's no argument that that's better for society. Like if you're an anarchist, then it makes life better. So like some small form of economic justice is definitely better than none, you know, like, I think even as an anarchist, you have to agree with that, like, you know, like, even as an anarchist, you can look at it that the strengthening we can't ask for anything, because we hate these people, and we, we should hate these people, but it doesn't mean we can't hate them. Right, well, I mean, I think, you know, the 40-hour work week is a, is a pretty compelling example um, of when, you know, Congress, uh, all these, you know, positive uh, social legislation that goes in. You know, um, the Wagner Act in the 30s, which, ele which legalized unions. Uh, before then, you, you could be prosecuted as a criminal syndicate if you organized as a union. Um, uh, all of these, especially things around the 8-hour workday, 40-hour work week, um, they were, they were, you know, de facto already enacted before Congress even brought them up. Um, most workers um, in large industries already had a 38-hour know, work week and were pushing for 35 by the time Congress said, okay, 40 is the baseline. So I think part of it is educating the, you know, the people in the movement, um, whichever movement we're in, you know, the actual history of how things got done. So it wasn't a matter of lobbying for a specific bill, and I, I think we agree on that. It's, it's um, direct action, so making sure the, you know, the world, the little slice of the world around you best fits with your conception of the good world. And then ex expanding that to the point where Congress has to catch up. And you know, putting like, putting general pressure on politicians, you sometimes get some interesting results. Like Nixon signed the EPA. Who saw that come? Um, there are there are a ton of examples of you know social movies applying enough pressure. Then I mean, any if you're a liberal reformist, you should be supporting radical and revolutionary movements because those are the ones that provide the leftward flank for. FDR to, to put Social Security in, in, in um, uh, LBJ to put in Medicare and Medicaid um, and strengthen Social Security. So it really it is win-win. If, if people on the radical left, you know, especially anarchists, if, if we're doing our jobs right, the reforms should happen. You know, and it's a question of uh, of doing our job. The last question. Then we're okay. Wait, can, can, we, can we do? One more on top of that from somebody who hasn't spoken. Okay. Well, I mean, in addition to the... Yeah. So this kind of talks about all of this, but I think it's also important to look at, like, you know, these things that we do from the ground up aren't just about the means of production. And when we're talking about reform, we can also... These same counter movements can be in terms of governance. So, for example, this one is a little bit more official, but this is very budgeting in Brazil is a really good example. Um, it's when people come together and actually decide how the money of the country is spent. So, for example, you can't have a collective that's going to build the roads of the community because they'll build this road and then what the hell are they going to do? So you have to actually have you actually have to have things that a government can and should do that we want it to do, which is build our roads, improve our infrastructure. But we want that process to be democratic. Okay. Okay.
Anybody else who hasn't been spoken yet? A comment, question? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I do, well, you've got to what I've said. I just think that people spend more time trying to figure out how to do things. Just do or stay outside themselves. Stay engaged, stay engaged, stay engaged. The more you learn how to stay engaged, the more the muscle you get, the more from the gets skits. But I just think it's also the big picture. Then you have a lot of you want to work with. You have to go to the very serum. Things are going to happen to you. That's right. Yeah, ra you know, radical, you know, small d democracy, much like driving and sex, has to be practiced to really learn to do that. <laughs> so we can't learn any of that from a textbook. Shame on anybody who has to live that way just from a textbook. It, you have to do it. Literally, you have to do it. That's that's what's going to make it work. And that means all these, what we think is utopian ideas of ways of running things. Um, people, us, you and me, you know, the people, they will become mature enough to use these really democratic functions through the act of struggling through, because the movements and organizations we're in will be democratic. We're going to learn this as it goes. We're going to learn together. So thank you very much for having us. Thank you.